Hello, folks. We're about to move into our next set of sessions here, starting at uh, 2.45 local time. Uh, right here on the main stage, you're going to have inclusive in interdisciplinary data storytelling. And uh, in the uh, room one, the data-driven entrepreneurship uh, business planning, an introduction to that, is going to kick off here uh, very shortly. And then uh, in room two, First Nation data sovereignty and 25 years of OCAP. So those are the sessions that are just spinning up right now. And uh, we'll move into the session here on the main stage. Take it away. Hi, folks. Uh, give me one sec. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to see you all. I wish that I could be where everybody else is, but I am trapped in Ontario right now. Um, my name is Sidra, and I am the Open Data Lead at the Employment and Social Development Canada uh, Chief Data Office, Data Intelligence Unit. And I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about what it looks like to tell amazing uh, stories with open data, primarily because I've been engaged in the open data space for a long time in different capacities. And I just think that uh, as we increasingly democratize data, it's a really great idea for all of us to learn about what the practical applications um, of data storytelling look like. And I know I've just said a bunch of words, but I'll get right into it. Uh, the entire focus of this is, have you ever been asked to build a dashboard? And I feel like folks in different capacities, whether you're a UX designer, a developer, a policy analyst, et cetera, et cetera, people have been asked to do things like this quite a bit in different capacities for different functions. So I'm gonna talk to you about what it is, what it looks like to really think about what you've been asked to do and think about what the best mechanism for uh, developing and then deploying your data story is going to be. Um, and you'd be surprised how creative that you can get. So essentially we'll cover what makes a really great story, how that's applicable to data, how you choose the right tools and techniques. We'll look at a couple of different methodologies. Uh, the focus there is going to be on the interdisciplinary aspect. We'll talk a little bit about accessibility, applicability, and then equity and inclusion as well. So I'm hoping that this has some practical significance as well as teaching you maybe some, some tips and tricks you might've not been aware of in the past. So, Here's me, I'm Sidra. Um, I come from a benefits space. So I've spent the last couple of years working uh, within employment and social development as a UX designer, uh, design lead, and now the open data lead. Um, and previously I worked with the city of Toronto's open data program. So I've been really immersed in the space and it's something I'm really passionate about. Before I start, I wanna acknowledge that the land on which I live and work and which the region of Peel operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I'm extremely grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give our respect to its first inhabitants. Um, I want to also add this quote by Jonelle Romero that I really like, which is that land acknowledgements are often well intentioned, but we always have to ask where do we go from here. When we talk about land acknowledgement we we have to talk about healing and we have to talk about reconciliation and land map. Um, so in those thoughts, let's start. If I ask you to tell me a story, most people have ways in which they use different narrative elements and contextual elements to give power and, and feeling to the story that they have to tell. So I could talk about bears, beds, and honey, and that wouldn't give you a lot of context. But if I structure that into a narrative, structure that into a story where, well, I came home the other day and I opened the door and there was a bear sleeping in my bed. I've added that context now. That's something that was not really supposed to happen was happening. Certainly shouldn't be happening in Toronto. Um, and then that narrative of, well, then I lured him out by uh, pouring some honey out the front door or something like that, which is, again, like it's a silly story, but it really helps you understand, you know, and that narrative is that that sugar that we add to sweeten up the story or maybe even the, the plot twist that we add to, to give a sense of sadness or just to make somebody feel something. And data can actually do these things, which is why a lot of this is so applicable. So if we talk about storytelling, it's about communication. It's about how you're gonna tell the story. And I'll talk about some of the mediums. There's messaging, what messaging you're going to share because you're not just handing over an Excel spreadsheet to somebody. And thirdly, what is the context? So what is the purpose of your messaging? And here's where we'll steal some concepts from service design and usability research to maybe apply some of these methods to the ways in which we're delivering our stories. So much like any other story, whether you read it in a book or whether it's a visualization or a chart, data storytelling is no different. Um, 
It's a really good story. Like I said, it'll give context. So a good data story isn't just leaving you with a lot of questions. A good data story can do that. But what it's also doing is helping you understand some variable or some aspect of the information you're looking at in a way that you maybe didn't before. Um, it's something that builds cohesion between different variables or different indicators, something that talks about a trend or a distinct difference, uh, something that highlights um, an item of interest, and then something that inspires action. So in my experience, really good um, data storytelling exercises typically end with recommendations um, and best practices because you want to have your audience walk away with something other than just smiling and nodding and agreeing. And so when you have data without a story, you often end up in information overload. Um, you know, people have limited time, people have, uh, you know, limited resources sometimes. And the last thing you want to do is put in all this work in building maybe this incredibly complex dashboard and have people overwhelmed with what it does, have low engagement and have mixed messaging where people are walking away with maybe a different message than you intended, which especially in the Fed when you're a bit risk averse can be really challenging. And by that, I mean, you know, a data set is a data set. And, you know, when you're doing a really good job of having unstructured or structured, super clean, unformatted raw data that's ideal for consumption by data tools, um, you're not exactly telling a story. You're leaving it up to somebody to tell the story. And that's great. This is actually part and parcel of developing your story. Uh, but raw data doesn't give us the full picture usually, right? Um, on the other hand, we've seen death by a thousand cuts with many dashboards. So this is an example of what well, we've visualized some data, but what are you walking away with? What is the end goal or the meaning um, of this data? And it really makes you think about how sometimes it feels like when you're just overloading a lot of these data visualization exercises with every chart that's imaginable under the sun. I often see people do this with Tableau and Power BI, and you really want them to scale back and think about, well, what is the messaging that you're trying to deliver? Um, maybe not every single uh, individual unit or cell needs to be represented in your visualization. Maybe some aggregation is required. So the first thing I want you to do is just let go of dashboards. Forget everything you ever learned about dashboards for five seconds. Let the purpose that you have determine the medium. So a data story can be told in quite a few ways. And again, for some reason, dashboards are really popular um, in governance, but they can be told in a couple of ways. Some of these ways we're pretty used to. You can use charts and graphs. You can use dashboards. You can even write articles. I'll show you some examples. You can have slide decks, um, and you can even have timelines that show maybe chronological uh, history of certain amount of like certain types of data. On the other hand, there are some actual uh, interesting ways as well that you can look at this. You've got infographics, which is a static way of exploring data. You can use music. Um, the more I learn about music production, the more I learn about how correlated data is with things like waveforms and fidelity. Visual art, uh, there are a lot of really cool data-driven art examples that do a great job of delivering messaging on key issues like climate change. Even textiles, and I'll touch on a really interesting example. And then even tattoos. If you've ever seen the movie Memento, that is actually a data gathering and storytelling exercise. Um, so first off, consider your audience. And so every good experiment will start with a hypothesis. If you show a bunch of charts and data dashboards and you start right off the bat by filling in what you can, it can be difficult to extract a story or a message. So what do you want your audience to walk away with? What is your intended message? Um, what is the aha moment for them where they look at something and they say, I had no idea X, Y was correlated or actually this gives me a lot of ideas for what we could do to improve this specific KPI. Um, and the reason why I really uh, insist on kind of drilling down into what your messaging and what your delivery is, is because it'll let you do better work. So your audience might be, for example, the public, in which case plain language will go a long way that covers the basic messaging. Um, you know, oftentimes when, when news sources or uh, publicity will report on specific uh, indicators that the government uses to measure social services, for example, they, they typically won't include things like p-value or the statistical significance of something, right? Because it's important for public communication to drill down and really contextualize the information in a way that is accessible. Um, some visualizations are interesting. You know, I think of like uh, many people really are happy with bar charts and good old pie charts. And then on the other hand, if you have like multivariable cohort analysis, that might be a level of analysis that's suited to a different audience than the general public. Um, one thing the public loves are service mapping tools, which people uh, often forget, but they have really high uh, consumption rates by the public. So something that lists like a list of social services that are being offered by a specific level of government, those tend to do really well. On the other hand, if your work, if you are one, or if your work is addressing policy analysis or development spaces, 
Um, dashboards can be pretty helpful, actually. If you've got basic query tools and you definitely don't know where to start, often recommend things like segregating by things like region, uh, age, and gender slash sex. If you have that data, it can be really interesting because they give you the opportunity to do some very interesting analysis, but also, also always provide the raw data that you're working with. Um, senior management, they don't have a lot of time, especially in, in the spaces in which I work. There's so many priorities. So it's always the candy. Think about what is the key takeaway that they want from this? Are you reporting on a couple of KPIs? Make their jobs easy for them. Give them that one visualization that they can use for ministerial reporting and really do a good job of trying to predict what you think they're actually looking for when they ask you to put together a dashboard. And then for public relations, a visual component goes a long way. I'll show you some examples real quick. But ultimately, it's about what does your audience care about? If I'm a decision maker, I might care about important relevant trends. I might care about you know, historical and predictive accuracy. I might care about potential implications on my funding as someone who delivers a program. Whereas if I'm a public advocate, I might be somebody that's looking at socio-demographic trends. I might be looking at maybe the policy implications um, and if I'm a statistician, not to reduce the work the statisticians do to math stuff, but I mean more that higher tier, more complex uh, statistical analysis, which actually is not typically the audience that we're building these storytelling tools from. For typically we're building these storytelling tools as a conduit for folks that need to understand this messaging, but aren't ready or equipped or have the time or resources to jump deep into the data. That is why we have statisticians and they play a very important role. Here's an example of a data visualization that I think does a really good job of telling a story. And it's using a couple of different visual elements, whether that's a scale. Um, this could just have been a list of every possible activity that you could do and its correlation with how at risk you might be uh, of being exposed to coronavirus. But on the other hand, what this uh, visualization has done is that it's used things like scale and color, um, as well as really clear language and this like very, uh, distinctly simple to understand, in my opinion, uh, low risk, medium risk, and high risk um, triage system. And I think that this does a really nice job of communicating right off the bat that, uh, yeah, you could go to a nightclub, but that's high exposure versus something like if you are to do some outdoor exercise, that's lower exposure. So sorry, my dog has decided now is the time to play with the squeaky toy. Here's another one that I really love. This one is from uh, Information is Beautiful, which is a really great public resource. Uh, with lots of different types of data stories from different um, organizations. But what I really like here is that uh, this basically demonstrates the correlation between something that's considered to be a holistic cure and how evidence-based it is in, in journals and through evidence-based science. So there's a strong correlation between, uh, you know, people talking about how fish oil and omega-3 in pregnancy can prevent preterm births, but then it turns out that the uh, literature also supports this. So this kind of goes through in a really interesting way. Um, I fully recommend looking at the full visual. It's really interesting, but again, it's about, they could have just given us a list or this giant dashboard, but instead they've really focused in specifically on the message that they want to communicate. So with that being said, a really good data story is contextual. Um, you know, in this case, sometimes you've got things like plain language articles that cover the basic messaging. Uh, it's clear, we've talked about, you know, getting to that candy, it's open, you're always in the spirit of open data, you're always including links to the data you've used to create the conclusions or analysis, especially if you're creating a public visualization, I strongly recommend having a mitigation plan to make sure that that data can also be made available, because if it is, um, sky's the limit as to how it can be contextualized, analyzed, all sorts of cool things can happen. So that, again, that key messaging will determine the chemistry of your story. Here's an example of an article that was written and was in Toronto Open Data. I thought this was really cool because this uh, is a data story that goes over uh, an example of how to use specific technology to perform a specific type of analysis. Um, and it's written in kind of this warm and, uh, way that really is welcoming to non-technologists like myself sometimes. Um, but the, this is one of the many ways in which you can tell a data story depending on the need. This is another way, this is a visualization I've used. There's no numbers, there's no scale, really. I was taking a lot of data sheets and I was simplifying them into this key messaging that I wanted our leadership to see. And so we kept it really simple. Um, this is another uh, numbers-based visualization. Again, it's a little bit candid, but I was trying to tell somebody about my experience accessing CERB and what, how tricky it was. Excuse me. I'm so sorry, folks. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, so that's, you know, I just used these numbers and I said, if I want somebody to spend 30 seconds looking at the slide, what do I want them to walk away with? 
uh, you know. So at the end of the day, it's important to accept your limitations and finding a balance between the utility, like who's going to use this, what purpose is this going to be used for, how long is it going to be used for, and the complexity. You know, does it make sense to build something from scratch? Does it make sense to build a Power BI dashboard? Or does it make sense to just make a little visualization? And that will all depend on this kind of thorough analysis of what, who it is you're delivering for and what you're delivering. The last thing you want to do is instead of pulling out your key messages, just jamming in every visualization you possibly can, because again, that makes it hard to extract key messaging. So here's an example of a dashboard that does exactly that, where there's just so much going on that it's really hard to rely on cues like color or scale or headings to really extract um, this immediate, essential, essentially an elevator pitch of what this dashboard is trying to say. I'm sure if I spend a lot more time on it, I'll figure out what it's about. But uh, people don't always have the time when they're doing data discovery work, right? So remembering that a dashboard can't do the work for you. Machines are great, but there's a level of automation that you have to be really wary of. Machines are really good at replicating bias. They're not as good at, at, at identifying it. And that's a topic of another talk entirely. But with that being said, there is uh, something to be said for taking an interdisciplinary approach to the way in which you represent and talk about your data. Numbers are great, but again, given your audience, I'm a big advocate for mixed methodologies. So looking at, you're also looking at quantitative um, data, you're performing that type of analysis, the things that, that the inherent metric that's important is that sample size, whereas on the qualitative side, you're looking at people's lived experience, things that are a little bit harder to measure or quantify. Um, and these things are both important. Some types of data has statistical significance and other types of data has practical significance. Um, scale doesn't always represent importance and vice versa. Um, and these are both, you know, I talk about how this is like making that perfect mix uh, of what it looks like to perform inter interdisciplinary data analysis, research um, and visualization, right? Looking at different tools that you can use. Um, I really want to quickly touch on a cultural context of decolonizing data um, because it's, um, I found a few examples and I was looking up, you know, what is the history of data, uh, of data visualization and the ways in which we tell stories, you know, many, many books in the Western context will reference, well, the beginnings of graphic communication come from the mid 17th century, where this cartographer in Europe created the first chart of statistical data. But hey, in a different context in research, as early as 1500 CE, the Incas were using knotted cords that were called hippos that are pictured here as a form of data visualization. So the color of the cord, the location and size of the knot, and the way the cords were tied to the primary cord all encoded data. Um, I went into the most interesting wormhole about this information, but uh, I highly recommend reading further up on it. So it's kind of really around that context of like, dashboard isn't the best. There's so many different ways to tell your story to a different audience. Um, again, cutting the clutter and unnecessary complexity. This is a visualization I really like because again, I could have had this big dashboard full of charts, but instead this animation really tells me immediately that there's this specific demographic trend in the ages of the percentages of folks um, of different age groups in the US population. So even this really simple animation does a great job of helping me walk away with the key messaging within 10 minutes. It's, it's now that we get to accessibility, right? So I've talked about these types of dashboards that have a lot going on. And uh, when we talk about accessibility, which is again, the subject of a whole nother talk, acknowledging that I'm running out of time. Um, imagine if almost 20% of your audience saw this visualization like this in black and white, and there might be folks in the audience that are colorblind. Quite a, quite a number of folks are, I think just over 10% of the population in Canada. Um, and so you wanna never lean on just one sense to communicate uh, something about your data. Uh, and what that means is don't lean on color alone, right? So I know people really like the traffic light system for data visualization, but again, that context is lost entirely on the right-hand side. So what I highly recommend is always doing things like using clear labeling so that folks that aren't relying on things like sight or contrast can also tell what your messaging is. Um, so there's there's three parts of every visual, uh, every accessible visualization or data story. So there's the visual, there's whether the look and feel uh, of this accommodates varying level of sightedness, high contrast, increasing the font size, decreasing. Does it contain um, relevance for different cultural contexts? Uh, by, by that I mean, do the, do the images I'm using, for example, in these visualizations reflect the people I'm talking about, for example? Um, content, 
uh, much like, you know, every, every math class I remember in middle school, like is all of the labeling clear, are there legends and labels? Again, not just relying on things like color, but relying on using more than one sense at all times to make sure that we can make the message as accessible as possible. And the third part is markup, the most complex. Does this work with modern assistive tools? Can this be accessed without proprietary tools? And is everything just ordered logically? So if a screen reader was gonna run through this PDF, can it read everything that it's supposed to read? Um, I had some examples of some infographics I like, but I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna touch on what it looks like for me to practically apply this to my work. So imagine I've been told, hey, make me a dashboard for people that receive uh, payments for this, this benefit, that, you know, X benefit. And so what I would do is instead of jumping in, I would take the same approach that I would as a service designer where I perform an initial analysis and I do all this environmental scanning and I review research and I look at literature and I understand that there's equity-based disparities in the relationship between the people who get X benefit and the people who actually are eligible for it. So then I prime the data, I clean it up, I remove blanks, I consolidate and aggregate what I need to do, tidy up the data source and make sure that I get my privacy, ATIP, public relations, deputy minister, whoever it is I need approval from for public release because if I'm releasing data story publicly, I am also releasing um, the data behind it. And then I'll wireframe it. What needs to go in what order? What should be above the fold? Which is what most people are gonna see first. What is the best sequence of charts to communicate my key message? And then implement that and I'd start thinking about software. I think about Power BI, vanilla HTML. What am I gonna use for this depending on resourcing? And what dimensions can this information be explored by, by my user? In some cases, it's static. In some cases, they need to be able to dive in, but most people have remarkably simple needs. Um, I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the do's and don'ts, but I will always happily share my slides with you. Um, I have some examples as well that you're welcome to scroll through of data stories that I love that use government data. Um, my favorite tool is whatever gets the job done. Here's some pros and cons on why I would use one over another. Um, again, going to skip through this really fast, but feel free to read up on them. Um, and then I even use this rough guideline chart that I've made up that just tells me like what is the right data storytelling tool for the type of data that I'm going to be telling a story about. So feel free to use this as well or uh, to ask further questions. So in summary, give your data context and purpose with the story. That's what a data storytelling tool is. Always provide your source data so other people can work with it and it's scalable. Always consider your audience, use interdisciplinary methods whenever possible, mix methods, talk to your SMEs, um, perform different types of analysis, speak with people that have lived experience of the community that you're talking about, and balance utility. How useful is this going to be with effort? How much work do I need to put into this? Um, I want to say thank you, but before I do that, I want to give a shout out to Sean Boots, because without him I would, would not be here. I'm so incredibly grateful for your constant support of my work. I wanna thank my CDO colleagues at ESDC, especially the open government team who gave a great presentation earlier, um, our departmental partners that have helped me a lot with uh, putting this presentation and the open data team at the city of Toronto, uh, because before I met them, I didn't know what open data was. Uh, so thank you so much. So I'm just getting to the front of the room here. If there are any uh, questions in the room or in the chat, we can field those right now. Mike one. I have uh, one question from the chat online from Steven, uh, who's asking, how do you find relevant context when it might not be obvious from the data? Imagine having sensor telemetry for 30 F1 cars over time, but not knowing the context of a track or a race. How would you approach developing hypotheses for context and testing forward, eventually establishing the context of a race and a track is the best way to tell the story of these F1 cars? That is a great question, particularly because my both my sisters are obsessed with Formula One racing and I don't watch it. So this is a good question, especially if you're somebody that might not have the familiarity with all the context that you need for the data. My approach is just to become an SME. I mean, an overnight SME and by that I mean, um, I have no problem admitting that when I'm new, new to some type of subject that I'm being asked to perform some type of analysis on, um, I go into Reddit, I type in explain like I'm five, and then I put in the subject. 
Uh, and I know that that seems like really elementary, but you know, when, for example, if I'm looking at like uh, uh, old age security in the context of like public benefits, uh, numbers are numbers, data is data, but at the end of the day, I don't actually have that much background on the program itself and maybe what it's like for recipients and what, what the cultural context is and uh, what the controversies are. Um, I'm a really big fan of finding white papers to read because they'll just tell you what the conflicts are. They'll often tell you like, here's the big controversy in the world right now. Um, I look for where those folks are speaking uh, and playing. So when it comes to things like, for example, um, you know, uh, different methodologies around how you deliver a story about a certain piece of data where you might not be like the subject matter expert, like finding somebody who is, is really helpful. Um, because it's really hard to discern context from data. But if somebody sits you down and says, listen, I'm really passionate about this and I'm gonna tell you everything I know about this, that can be a really nice way to start to pick up some of, okay, well, this is what these folks care about. This is what matters. Um, and I, I mean, applying the exact same uh, application to like, if you're looking at like telemetry, um, thinking about, well, what work has already been done. You know, academics are really good at doing environmental scans and looking at existing data. And I wish we specifically in the government space did a little bit more of that. And that just doesn't have to be pulse surveys. We can look at cross contextual data, um, you know, from academia, from other spaces. Um, you know, I read parenting blogs when I'm looking at information about like what the experience is for somebody who is trying to access childcare because I do not have children of my own other than these dogs. So, you know, in order to just understand more of the context around the data I'm working, just time to read. That's usually what I do. I hope that that's an okay answer. Not very specific. I see one more question in the room here. Thanks, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'm, I come from, um, I guess, a, a background where we have a, sort of often a segregation between the folks that work with the, the data and the data sets um, and the creation of data sets. Um, compared to the people that are often then uh, tasked to communicate out those data sets. So I'm wondering in your experience uh, in, in a government context, how have you worked to break down those barriers between the kind of the communications teams, those knowledge mobilization teams, and then also the storytelling from your own uh, data perspective? Where, where have you been able to get some wins? Because you have some very swish graphics, so I know, <laughs> I know you're doing it right. So any words of wisdom for us, please? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I'm, I'm so new in this role. I've only been the uh, open data lead for a couple of months now uh, at the CDO, and uh, we ha we've had a couple of wins, and I'm I'm honestly so excited about this. Um, so uh, essentially, like when I first came in, um, you know, open government it, at the government of Canada, it's a huge, miraculous, miraculous beast. And I'm with the SDC, which is the fourth largest organization. And immediately when I came in, I said, okay, I know that you all have not had a dedicated resource for open data which means that things have moved a little bit slow, but um, what, what are we doing? Like, why have we only published X amount of data sets in this you know, limited amount of time? And when I'm looking at them, some of these data sets, I feel like could be just significantly better quality. So some of the things that we've implemented, so there's a couple of things. Um, there's a new governance process, which is really exciting. And that's essentially from doing interviews with and environmental scans and talking to other folks in the organization, uh, speaking with data stewards, acknowledging that oftentimes for them, data is like corner of the desk work for them. It's not a priority. Priority is not part of their daily job. So thinking about, well, how do we conduct a process that makes it easier for them? And then immediately realizing, well, hey, it turns out that a lot of folks aren't aware of, they know why it's important to publish open data. They don't realize why you would do that. And you know, from my time in municipal, I have nothing but examples of like amazing things that people have done using open data, like predicting the next streetcar. Uh, it's a little bit harder to replicate those examples on the federal level, although in my presentation I have some examples, but um, so really touching on like, okay, like we need a bit of internal excitement generated around why it's important to publish data sets and like what the applicab applicability is. And to do that, we're going to make the process easier and more efficient. Um, and so, you know, we have to do a lot of consultations and, you know, we're a very risk averse organization, rightfully so. We have access to some of people's most private information. Uh, we have a bajillion information sharing agreements, like things get pretty messy. Um, but within that, we were able to extract like what absolutely needs to be done in what order um, and formalize it and operationalize it a little bit um, and attach names and roles to responsibilities. So um, other things, you know, I know 
the open government team talked about uh, how they've added some uh, measures for automated data quality checking, just things to empower our data stewards to make their jobs easier, you know, giving them blank templates and saying like, here's how you need to structure your data set to avoid a lot of like caveats, um, getting it in the hands of privacy and a tip and folks like that early, early on in the game, as opposed to waiting till the very end for them to say, yes, let's go, uh, making our data stewards jobs easier by making sure that it's really clear and giving them examples of like, here's how to pro you know, provide your briefing note and all of the other collateral that has to go with this. Um, dem demoing really great data sets, highlighting like, here's what these folks have done well, um, all sorts of things. So it's early days, but we have the support of a very, very supportive CDO who I'm really grateful for. So uh, we've started to implement some of these, you know, new renewed governance processes. So fingers crossed, but you're going to see more exciting things from ESDC Open Data soon. I'm I'm optimistic. Thank you thank you, Sidra. Um, we gotta we, we've just gotta move on with the agenda. We could talk about this all afternoon. I see I saw people in the room here uh, scribbling notes or UX workers, uh, people who build dashboards. I see this going on. Uh, so very compelling piece of content there. Thank you very much for sharing that.